Linda will introduce Ted. Bring her on, please. Well, how do you know if you can trust your government? <laughs> well, actually, no, you shouldn't laugh about that because really what you need to know to find out if you can trust your government is learning from credible people with documentation whether or not you can trust your government. And I'd like to introduce Ted as being a former special agent in charge of the FBI. That was a senior special agent. He was with the Bureau for 27 and a half years, and by the time he left, he had 700 employees under his command. And that's 27 and a half years. That's good enough for the FBI. That's good enough for me. He's the recipient of various awards for outstanding performance in law enforcement. I think it's an incredible gift that we have somebody with his qualifications giving us information when so many other government people will not tell us anything. And if they talk to us, it's lies. So what we should do with the information Ted's giving us is join together and use it so that we can help bring America back to the way it was intended as expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Now, I first met Ted when I was doing the uh, coverage of the McVeigh trial for various freelance right-wing conservative publications. He called me and he asked if I would uh, give him some of these reports. And at first I was nervous. I thought, well, I don't want to be associated with fruitcakes. So I figured I'll do something that generally scares away fruitcakes. I'll tell him he's got to pay me. And he said, no problem. And so then I thought, all right, who are you and what do you stand for? And he sent me the most incredible documentation I've ever seen. And this is the material he's going to present to you today. And because time precludes us from showing you everything, I'm going to encourage you all to come to his workshop because if some of you out there need to see mainstream media present the evidence that you'll rely on, we've got it. And, I, and we can only show it to you during the workshop. But in the meantime, I'd like you to welcome Ted Gunderson and tell him thank you for coming on to our side. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm wired. Uh, thanks very much, folks. I guess I'm wired. Everybody can hear me in the back. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to mention that uh, one of the early programs that was mailed to me showed I was going to have two hours and 15 minutes to lecture. So I came here prepared to talk for two hours and 15 minutes, and I was going to put Linda on and... Uh, Galen Windsor on, and we were just going to have a grand old time. Then I, I was just informed this morning I only have an hour. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tonight, and it will include uh, Bryce Taylor, Linda, and Chip Tatum. Chip's going to talk about how the CIA uses the satanic movement and mind control. Uh, Bryce has her own personal experiences. I'm going to talk, uh, we'll finish up, Linda and I'll finish up on the Oklahoma City bombing. What we can't give you here right now, because we don't have the time to do so, and, uh, and then I will uh, chip, uh, uh, chime in with, uh, with Bryce, and she and I work together. I have some slides of some abandoned satanic sites. Um, I have uh, information about um, the McMartin case in California. I was the one that coordinated a tunnel dig. The kids said there were tunnels under the school. The authorities said those kids were hallucinating. They were not hallucinating. Uh, everybody got off, if you know that case at all. I went in in the spring of 1993. Uh, signed a liability contract, put uh, $17,000 of my own money into it. It cost about 55000 to do it. We brought in a professional excavator, archaeologist. We found tunnels under the school. The kids were telling the truth. Um, also, we'll be talking about Aleister Crawley tonight in the workshop. Uh, I have his writings. I can show you and tell you why they sacrifice humans. We can tell you why they have ritual abuse and sexual abuse toward children. We'll talk about the kidnapping rings, the international kidnapping ring that's been uh, it's extended across this country that the FBI is fully aware of because I have personally written them a letter. I wrote to the Attorney General of the United States about an international child kidnapping ring. I have yet to see an FBI agent come and interview me about it. I have personal knowledge. I've talked to the kids that are involved in the ring and it infuriates me. But anyway, these things didn't go on when I was in the Bureau. They really didn't. I didn't. At least I didn't know about it. Maybe because I was categorized. Uh, I only developed information about the extensive, extensive corruption and uh, satanic activity and uh, government cover-ups after I left the Bureau in 1979. And it all developed. It started through the Jeffrey R. McDonald case. He's a former Green Beret doctor 
who was convicted of murdering his wife and two children, Fort Bragg, February 17, 1970. He did not commit those murders. They were committed by Helena Stokely and her uh, fellow uh, Satanists. I have signed statements, confessions, and everything, and a summary of that case is uh, back uh, at my table down this last aisle on the left. Uh, also, uh, I've not only been on the street and investigated these matters, particularly since I left the FBI, but I've done the research and I've worked and networked with people like Bryce, and uh, we have the documentation, believe me, and it's out there, and our government is so unbelievably corrupt and out of, uh, out of way out of line that it's, uh, it's difficult for me to even accept it. And, and that's why I established my own radio talk show. I'm on, uh, I'm on here in Denver, two hours every morning, 9 to 11. I'm also on shortwave, American Freedom Network. I'm on in Denver at uh, 1360 AM and 1370 KTMG. Uh, and uh, also on the Worldwide Christian Radio Network, uh, the last hour of the show. We've been talking about Trilateral Commission, the Oklahoma City Bombing, Federal Reserve, illegal drug operations, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, anyway, I'm sitting in my living room on January 19th, not, not January, April 19th, 1995. I had just purchased a trampoline. I said to myself, you know, I haven't exercised in years, although when I was a kid I played football, track, and wrestling and all that. And I'm going to start exercise. I'm going to get an exercise program. And I was the first day on my trampoline watching television at 7 o'clock in the morning. This is Pacific time. And on comes Oklahoma City bombing. That's the last time I've been on my trampoline. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I had to give it up. But I still have the trampoline, I might mention. Um, but the first thing I noticed is uh, I received a fax. And this fax uh, was a seismogram from the University of Oklahoma. And here is the seismogram. And this seismogram shows that there were two events. There's one event there and one event there. Ten seconds apart, one at 9.02 and three seconds, the other at 9.02 and 13 seconds. Here's a larger one of it. An enlargement of it. You can see there's one event there and there's one event there. And immediately the government came out and said it was a 1,200-pound ammonia nitrate bomb. And then they raised it up to, I think, 2,500, and then they raised it up to 4,800. And uh, knowing that an ammonia nitrate fertilizer bomb, we'll call it an ANFO bomb, only has one detonation, I said to myself, you know, there's something that doesn't fit right here. The University of Oklahoma says there's two ground swells, two detonations, and the government says it was an ammonia nitrate bomb. And that started me on my way, and uh, so I started checking into it, and um, I received a phone call from Michael Reconosuto. Michael's a friend of mine, ex-CIA, uh, been set up and framed on a drug deal. He's serving 30 years at the federal penitentiary. And Michael said, uh, I said, Michael, are you, are you familiar with the Oklahoma City bombing? Yes. Um, let me read this seismogram to you and give you some information. He says, Ted, that's my bomb. Now, he didn't mean that was his bomb that exploded, but he used to, his family owned the Hercules Manufacturing Company in the Silicon Valley and they developed this electrohydrodynamic gaseous fuel device. We'll call it, uh, for short, a barometric bomb. Michael said, explain the, the reason it was not an ammonia nitrate bomb. And of course, this was several days after the explosion. And I'm on my way. I personally made two trips to Oklahoma City out of my pocket, paid for it myself uh, to investigate this matter. I was so incensed over this government cover-up. And there's, uh, I have a report here this report is available, by the way, in the back of the table. It's 160-some pages long. A lot of the information was too short to present it here this morning or this afternoon. Uh, but uh, some of the reasons we can tell you definitely it wasn't an ammonia nitrate bomb. It has too much moisture to be effective, as was the situation in Oklahoma City. It was just one. This report has like 16 instances of why it was not an ammonia nitrate bomb. And what usually happens is the propagation from the initial detonation would be uneven and it would scatter the bulk of the material before contributing energy to the bulk of the explosion. That bomb in Oklahoma City was directional and I'll show you some pictures in a few minutes uh, now that shows how the destruction of that building compared to the destruction of the bomb in Saudi Arabia. Um, and then another reason is an FBI agent testified the McVeigh shirt contained PDTN which is uh, one of the chemicals for ammonia nitrate bomb in one news report, and PETN was identified in another report, uh, the propagation would have been uneven and there would have been no way to shield such a blast. 
the ammonium nitrate bomb, fertilizer bomb, would go in 360 degrees up, down, all directions. In this particular case, as I said, it was directional. It was aimed right at uh, the Murrah building. There are, uh, as I said, a number of reasons why it was not an ammonium nitrate bomb. I'm going to skip through them real fast. The signature of the Oklahoma City bomb was not that of a fertilizer bomb, but it does match the signature of the A neutron bomb. And the University of Oklahoma Geology Survey reports that there were two bomb blasts in Oklahoma City 10 seconds apart. The media has ignored this as well as other evidence. An ammonia nitrate truck bomb of the size reported does not produce a crater, it blows upwards. A growing number of bomb experts are coming forward and saying that it appears two or more sophisticated bombs were detonated inside the building. As a matter of fact, there is a video being circulated. I have a copy of it. We'll show it in the workshop tonight. Where um, they showed from five out, for five hours after the blast, the news releases on television. And in two instances, in the first, they said that they discovered another bomb inside the building and everybody was running from the building. And then they apparently detonated that, or not detonated, but uh, neutralized that bomb. And then they came back and they said there was another bomb, a second bomb inside the building. And in that particular instance, the press release was made that it was an army bomb and the Oklahoma City bombing uh, squad could not neutralize that bomb and they had to call the army in. The announcer made the statement that this is good news in a way because now we will know who manufactured the bomb. Because there is a way, if you have the bomb, of determining who manufactured it. And also, even after it's been detonated, there is a way to determine who has manufactured that bomb. Other reasons why it was not ammonia nitrate bomb, uh, bomb experts all over the country have argued that the bomb, the truck bomb, was not parked at the right spot to do the resulting damage. Private citizens monitoring the Oklahoma City band overheard the Oklahoma bomb squad discuss the finding of undetonated bombs with military markings on the canister inside the building. This was subsequently reported on national television as viewing audiences watched people run away from the building. The bomb could not have been built by a former uh, Prussian Gulf Army war veteran, Timothy McVeigh, and his rural Michigan farming uh, friends, brother James and Terry Nichols, at least not without the aid of persons as yet unknown. Those persons would need to possess knowledge of research classified at the very highest level of top secret by the U.S. government in addition to access to the various array of chemical and electronic components. Now, what, what Michael said was he thought this bomb was the signature of his bomb, and that's why that last statement was made. In other words, there is a cover-up in Oklahoma City. They blamed it on McVeigh. They've insisted that it was a ammonia nitrate bomb because if there's anything other than ammonia nitrate bomb, McVeigh and or other people would have to have sophisticated knowledge of what type of bomb it was. In this particular instance, McVeigh did not have the qualifications, the knowledge, or the sophistication to have put a bomb of the uh, type, the um, electro, uh, electrohydrodynamic gaseous fuel device together. Gunderson has been contacted indirectly by a federal criminal investigator who was involved in the investigation. He stated that the Oklahoma City bombing was with a dual charge. Had it been an ammonia nitrate bomb, the workers would not have been allowed in the area without wearing breathing uh, um, devices due to the presence of nitric acid vapors. He advised that John Doe II was vaporized by design, was to have been vaporized by design. That McVeigh is also a throwaway. He stated that the debris was collapsed toward the crater. There was something inside the building, probably another bomb. It was a shear and drop charge. The investigators have looked for signs of unoxidized ammonia nitrate pellets left over after the explosion, but none were found. And then uh, this investigator at the scene says that uh, my deductions were 100% correct. A nuclear physicist from one of the nation's top three government laboratories anonymously confirmed that the A-neutron device, as designed by Microcona Sudo, is far more likely to have caused the damage in Oklahoma City than a crude fertilizer bomb. And this just gives you a nice little quick diagram. By the way, uh, Galen Windsor has another theory on it, and Galen's going to also participate, and he's sitting down here in the front row in the workshop tonight. Uh, this is the size of uh, the neutron bomb, or the elect electronic uh, barometric bomb. I'm going to go over this pretty fast because... Now, how does it work? This particular bomb releases... Messing up the microphone. 
this particular bomb uh, releases a white chemical. I'm not a, a technician, so I'm going to give you in layman's terms. This particular bomb releases a white chemical cloud. Milliseconds later, a dark chemical cloud. And um, in visiting Oklahoma City, I talked to a witness on the seventh and eighth floor, two different people. And this white chemical cloud followed by the dark chemical cloud is milliseconds. It would be like this, boom, boom, with the second blast louder than the first and more powerful than the first. Uh, in talking to these people, these two men, they survived, of course, and I asked them to reenact what they heard that day. And both of them, independent of each other, in and interviewed separately from each other, said it was like this. It was boom, boom, with the second explosion being louder than the first. That would have been the first blast. I feel, I don't know, I can't say for sure, that the 10 second blast later was probably a bomb on the inside. And I feel that there were probably two other bombs on the inside that did not explode, did not detonate. Uh, I suspect that uh, the individuals who were responsible for the bombing had planned to lower level the total building with those other bombs on the inside. I talked to a assemblyman who was looking out the fifth floor of the state capitol building at the time of the bombing. He said he looked out when he heard the explosion and he saw a white chemical cloud about 150 feet reach up into the air followed by spiraling dark cloud. So it was white and then it was dark. A lady who was interviewed on television, CNN, she uh, and, and she was, I think, in the in the area of the nursery, made the statement that everything was white, and then everything was dark. This is uh, this goes into the this is in the report. I don't. I, we're not going to read it now. We don't have time. Besides, you probably put you to sleep as it is. Uh, this is uh, from an article. Uh, by the time staff, I think that's the uh, LA Times. In addition, bomb experts and evidence technicians are uh, operating on a theory that, and I can't read it, elaborate one-on-one -on -one explosion device was wired inside the truck and used uh, to set off the detonation, which then triggered a second massive explosion. But perhaps more important sources said that the double something might have been the um, bomber, probably two unidentified white men who rented the truck earlier that month, enough uh, to get out of the vehicle and rush safely away before the blast tore through the landmark building. That's just something that we picked up in, in uh, reviewing every material. There were a number of people who said there was a John Doe 2. This is a sketch that appeared in the newspaper. This is uh, John Doe II, and we're going to talk about him a little later on. Um, the um, day that the truck was arranged to be rented, that was on a Saturday before the Wednesday of the bombing, um, McVeigh has been identified, along with John Doe II as having gone into the Elliott Body Shop in Junction City, Kansas, made arrangements and then uh, picked up the uh, truck the following uh, Monday, I think it was. And then Tuesday they were seen, this truck was seen, or a similar truck was seen out by a lake all day by people driving to and from work. And then the morning of the explosion, a number of people have identified McVeigh and John Doe too as having been occupants of the truck. We'll get more into details in later on. We talk about John Doe too. This is a story that actually appeared in the LA Times, May the 10th, 1995, shortly after the bombing. And um, we probably don't have a lot of time to read all this, but what this basically, this is a joke, really. I mean, if it wasn't so serious, it'd be funny. They talk about John Doe II in here. Uh, meantime, investigators began to fear that they were given a false lead to the description of the long sought suspect known as John Doe II who was said to have accompanied McVeigh to the Junction City, Kansas rider truck franchise to rent the vehicle, allegedly using the bombing. Some are even advanced the theory that John Doe II was Nichols, who bear little, little resemblance to the FBI's uh, composite drawing of the suspect, or possibly even Nichols' son, 
who appears to be as tall as five foot seven and to weigh as much as 170 pounds. That's uh, Josh Nichols, and I've interviewed him, by the way. Uh, one source close to the case said that if John Doe 2 turns out to be Joshua Nichols, the likelihood is that an innocuous role, uh, uh, that he could be helpful as a witness in the case. And it goes on and tells about all the possibilities about John Doe 2, not once, not once really dealing with facts uh, that, as we've seen them since then. Under this assumption, the investigator said that the theory that Jaden Nichols was the brains behind the now bombing scheme would work. Terry Nichols was the expert in building the explosive. McVeigh was the man who would carry out the plot. McVeigh was too smart, was not smart enough to build this, and it goes on and on. And then it talks about that accomplice, the alleged John Doe II. Also could be someone still unknown to the federal investigators. It could be a real loner or a drifter, the sources said. If you have an opportunity to buy the report, which is back there, you'll read that article in detail. It'll be rather amusing. Now, there have been certain people who have claimed that this bomb, barometric bomb, does not exist. And you see here, this is uh, from the Atlas Powder Company, Tyler Corporation, Dallas, Texas. This is a, uh, an article that appeared in a science magazine. I don't have the name of the magazine. It's up here. I can't read it right now. Uh, it was discovered that uh, agriculture fertilizer prills, when made into ANFO, had very poor explosive characteristics. They will not detonate efficiently because of their highly high density, lack of propensity, and heavy inert coating of anti-setting agents. Now, um, this is continuing with this article. This article goes on and talks about a list of the key contracts in defense and aerospace. The IRCO Incorporated, Salt Lake City, Utah, they talk about a $2,618,000 contract uh, increment as part of a $5 million plus uh, contract, full scale development of the tactical explosive system, so on and so forth. The work is to be performed and expect to be completed by November 2291. There are 34 bids, so on and so forth. Bottom line, this is the contract number, DAAA 2190-C-0045, dated June 14, 1990. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the barometric bomb contract. We uh, then took that information wrote to the Department of the Army in Picatinny, Arkansas, uh, Arkansas, New Jersey, Arsenal, and we asked them for the information on the government contract for that particular contract right there, and they wrote back, and by the way, this is public information, they wrote back and said, review and research of your request, please be advised that no information pertaining to that contract number has been located. So what we're saying there is, we have proof that this bomb does exist, and the government it says that they can't find any record of it. So we happen to know through our sources, Dinah Nobel manufactured that bomb. We wrote to Dinah Nobel, and right there, Salt Lake City, Utah, and wrote this letter and asked them to send us information on this particular contract number, so on and so forth. And that was dated uh, June 2nd, 19, or September 2nd, 1995. We're still waiting for a reply and don't expect one. Okay, let's look at, uh, can you see this crater here? Just, it's difficult to see, but that's the size of the crater in the uh, Saudi Arabia. I'll give you more details on that in just a minute. There's a comparison. Saudi Arabia and the World Trade Center, or not World Trade, and the Oklahoma City bombing. Now, the reason we're comparing these is because the government says that the bomb in Saudi Arabia was 5,000 pound info bomb, info bomb, eight story building. The truck was parked 35 yards away. The crater there, 85 feet deep and 35, excuse me, 85 feet wide and 35 feet deep. Oklahoma City, about the same size, 4,800 pounds, ammonia nitrate, nine story building, the crater was 20 feet deep and 30 feet wide. Look at the difference. 85 feet wide, 30 feet wide. 35 feet deep, 20 feet deep. Yet they were supposed to be about the same size. 
And um, this is the uh, letter from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Oklahoma. But before I go to this, uh, let me mention that nobody knows for sure, except the government, as to what type of bomb was used. All I can say, 100%, it was not an ammonia nitrate bomb. It was not a fertilizer bomb. Um, General Pardon has an opinion on what he thinks happened. Galen has an opinion on what he thinks happened. We feel that our bomb played a part in it somehow or other. But this is the, uh, from the Office of the Medical Examiner. This is from the leg that was found at the scene, the strange leg. Among this tissue is a, a traumatically uh, uh, amputated left thigh and lower leg recovered on May the 30th. This leg was clothed in black military type boot, two socks and an olive drab uh, blousing strap. Anthropologic analysis of this specimen reveals that the individual to be light skinned, dark haired, probably less than 30 years of age, male undoubtedly 75% probability having an estimated height of 66 inches plus or minus three inches. This leg has not been matched to any of the known victims of the survivors. The leg was sent to the FBI laboratory. They came back and said it was a black female. <laughs> now, the bomb, that, the, the uh, electrohydrodynamic gaseous fuel device, barometric bomb, has to be pointed and locked. It's a directional bomb. We think there's a possibility that this leg came from somebody inside the back of the truck. Okay, again, this is in a comparison. World Trade Center bombing, 1,200 pounds, supposedly. Difference between Oklahoma City, Saudi Arabia. I've already gone over that. Um, and the uh, Oklahoma City bombing was limited primarily to the surrounding area. It can be attested to this as I personally visited the site. The Saudi Arabia bomb was at 360 degrees in all directions. Now, look at the... Uh, Look at the difference in the bomb here. This is uh, Oklahoma City there. And here, this is Saudi Arabia. A clean shear cut right across. There was definitely a difference. And we go on, we say, uh, in London uh, Sunday Telegraph by Ambrose Pritchard, who was recently uh, taken out of the Washington, as a Washington correspondent, sent back to London because he was causing too many problems for Bill Clinton, in my opinion. And he goes on and explains how uh, the Wilburns, Glenn and uh, his wife, who lost uh, two grandchildren, conducted their own investigation. And as a result of the work that they performed, uh, John Doe II has been identified. And uh, he's been identified by several individuals. And this is the details here. We don't have time to go into it. And as a fellow named Michael Brescia, Michael Brescia is a, uh, um, very actively involved in the Aryan Army out of Elham City. And here's, a, here's John Doe II. Here's Brescia right there. He does have some similarity. The details, again, are in these articles. Now, we also had uh, McVeigh's lawyers claim, this is in the uh, U.S. Or spotlight, McVeigh's lawyers claim a bombing cover-up. And, of course, Hoppy Heidelberg, the grand juror, came forward. I've interviewed Hoppy. I interviewed him for eight hours. And under attorney-client privilege, I can't give you all the details. But Hoppy said that there was a cover-up, that the government refused to allow the grand jury to ask questions about John Doe II. And furthermore, uh, they, uh, there were certain stipulations and regulations and restrictions placed on the grand jury. They were not allowed to ask direct questions. They were supposed to go through the U.S. attorney, entirely foreign to any <coughs> grand jury that I've ever been involved with. Now, two years later, the U.S. government came out, and they said, the USGS, US Geological Survey, signed and say that they snuffed the multiple bomb theory. It took them two years to decide this, right? They say that the puzzling dual uh, waves are, in fact, a single wave that divided underground. By the way, the University of Oklahoma has not recanted. They've stuck with their story that there were two ground swells, and they still feel that there were two detonations. The uh, paper that wrote, reported that last article came and asked me my opinion, and I said, Ted Gunnerson, Los, An Las Vegas, former head of the FBI office, Los Angeles, now a stalwart conspiracy theorist and Nevada congressional candidate. I, ran for, I got mad and ran for Congress. I also got mad and ran for president against Clinton in the primary, New Hampshire and Texas, just to expose him. I knew I couldn't win on an independent ticket. And surprisingly enough, I came out 11th out of 21 in New Hampshire. 
I never registered as a Democrat before, but I figured the only way I can take him on is take him on in the primary. And I came out fifth in Texas. We had over 15,500 votes in Texas. But anyway, uh, they described me as a congressional candidate. Gunderson says the next time I believe press release from the U.S. government will, pro will probably be the first time in years, regardless of whether they say it's, it's scientific or not. And that's the way I really feel, too. Okay, we'll discuss very briefly. I want to get back to Lynn in just a few minutes. The World Trade Center bombing. This is an article in the October 28, 1993. New York Times, also a similar article in the Los Angeles Times. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the reason I bring this up, the World Trade Center bombing, is because the bomb used there was supposed to have been similar in nature, an ANFO bomb, as the other two bombings I mentioned earlier. The reason this is a very unusual case is because the FBI had an informant, Mr. Salam, a 43-year former Egyptian officer, they had an informant, in with the terrorists. And this informant, Mr. Salam, was clever enough during his conversations with his FBI handlers to record his conversations. When it came time to prosecute the terrorists, he reminded them that he secretly recorded their conversations with him and you're not going to prosecute me. And um, so they didn't prosecute him. I'd like to also point out that in addition to him recording this, the significant fact is that the FBI furnished the ingredients for the bomb. So they not only knew about the bombing in advance, they furnished the ingredients. <coughs> and this, <coughs> excuse me, this article documents that. It's actually in the paper. Now, why aren't our congressmen in Washington, D.C., pounding on the desk and saying, I want an investigation? Now, this trial is about to begin. In fact, it just began in New York City. Mr. Uh, Ramsey Yosef. The head terrorist is CIA trained, a CIA trained terrorist. Here's Mr. Ramsey Yosef. And um, why did they have why did they have the World Trade Center bombing? Why did they have Oklahoma City bombing? Why let me tell you why? Because back in the early in the eighties. The anti-terrorism legislation was written under the George Bush administration. A lady author, one of the authors, Department of Justice attorney, made the statement, before this legislation will pass, people will have to be killed. I suspect and I contend that the World Trade Center bombing occurred for that reason, but there weren't enough people killed, folks. Six people killed. I mean, it's sad. There are only six. Six is a lot but not enough to pass the anti-terrorism legislation. Half a million dollars in damage, a thousand people injured, not enough. Two years later, Oklahoma City, 168 killed, probably 169 millions of dollars in damage. The anti-terrorism bill has now passed. And what does the anti-terrorism bill do, folks? Very brief summary. Search without search warrants. The president can label groups as terrorists. He can call the First Baptist Church or the temple or the Catholic St. Mary's Church on the corner a terrorist group. Illegal taps are legal as long as the police feel that they were acting in good faith. I mean, that's carte blanche, right? And by the way, there's, I, I suspect there's thousands of illegal taps right today. My phones in where I live right now are being tapped. I had them checked here this last week. Firearms sold, used in a crime later. Um, if you sell a firearms to an individual and it's later used in a crime, maybe he sells it to somebody else, but you don't even know about it. The first person that sold it can be punished for up to five years in jail. Seizure of assets, they're already doing that. They arrest you and then they seize your assets and you have no money to defend yourself. So they give you a court-appointed attorney who's part of the system and you don't have a prayer. Secret, there are certain instances where they can present secret evidence and you do not face your accuser. The United States of America. Okay, how, how much time do we have? I got 20 minutes, okay. I'll just, a little brief, and then I'm gonna let uh, Linda come up and finish up. Uh, Linda's my colleague, my friend, my buddy, and also Chuck, her, uh, her husband. Okay, we do have some heroes coming out of Oklahoma City. Terry uh, Yeager, he was a, 
sergeant with the Oklahoma City Police Department. He started checking around, doing his own investigation. And about a year, on May the 8th, 1996, after the bombing, a year after the bombing, his body was found in a field. He'd been shot through the head. The bullet entered the uh, foggy side of his head above and between the ear and the uh, eye. It exited at the lower, the left cheek bone between the left nostril, the lower part of the ear, just above the ear lobe. If he shot himself, he would have held the gun with his right hand at an awkward angle. He had knife wounds as follows. Both his right and left jugular veins on his neck were cut. Two slash marks inside right elbow. Three slash marks inside right wrist. Four slash marks inside left elbow. Two slash marks inside left wrist. Death was ruled self-inflicted. Gunshot. <laughs> By the way, his body was found a mile, and a, or, uh, a mile and a half from his car in the field. A real hero, folks. There's a death certificate that shows the injuries. Juggler vein, cut left and right side. First of all, you bleed to death before you have a chance to shoot yourself. There's the entrance of the bullet and exit down here. And these are uh, some witnesses who've been developed. We've developed independent of the government. A number of us have 16 witnesses. Those are all listed in the report, folks. I have a limited number of reports back there. I only think I have about 10 or 11, so if you're interested. And then uh, last but not least, Carol Howe, an informant for the BATF. Uh, Carol um, went out to El Home City, became involved uh, with an Aryan race group. She reported to the BATF two years prior to the bombing that they were going to bomb one of three buildings, either two in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or the federal building in Oklahoma City, the Murrah Building. They made this, this group, this Aryan group, made three trips to Oklahoma City to case the building, one in uh, ja December, January, and February, before the year before the bombing, the months before the bombing. And uh, she personally made one of the trips. She even gave the ATF agents the date of the bombing, and, um, you know, they, did, they said she was a dingbat. This was two years she worked as an informant for them. Now, she went public with this information after the bombing. And after the bombing, she was interviewed by the FBI. She said that John Doe II is Michael Brescia, that uh, Andreas Strassmeyer himself worked with McVeigh and Brescia. Strassmeyer came to the United States in 1989 on a promise of working with the U.S. Department of Justice as an informant. This is in the London Sunday Telegraph, by the way. He admitted that to Ambrose Pritchard. And um, they have yet, in two years afterwards, they still had not interviewed Strassmeyer. They called him over in Germany, said he was not a suspect. They're not involved to their knowledge. Uh, Carol Howe made the statement and told the feds, FBI, and the BATF uh, that uh, McVeigh visited Strassmeyer and Brescia on a regular basis. What's happened to Carol Howe? Well, they filed criminal charges against her. And just a week or so ago, they had a trial, and fortunately, she was acquitted. I called her attorneys, yes. I called, when I heard about the trial, I personally called the family and told them that as a former FBI chief, I would voluntarily come up to Tulsa, testify at the trial as to the way the government administratively handles informants and also uh, to the fact that if you're going to be an informant, you've got to get down with the pigs and wallow in the mud. And uh, they accused her of uh, planning a conspiracy uh, to um, bomb 15 cities because her boyfriend had a message on the uh, telephone message pad that if certain things don't happen by a certain date that the uh, there will be an uprising in the Aryan uh, army will bomb 15 cities. Your boyfriend had this on there. And the basis of that, the FBI raided the house. They found some parts of what they considered parts to a bomb, and they accused her of being involved with him. He was tried and convicted. Okay, Linda. Let me turn this over to Linda. Linda uh, reported to me on a daily basis. She tested me. I didn't know that till just now. It cost me a lot of money, 1800 bucks, and uh, it was worth it. <laughs> She covered the trial for me. <laughs> and I have my radio show now. I hope you folks will consider listening to my radio show. 
whenever you have a chance. It's very good. I have some hot people on there. I've had Bob on there. I had Chip Tatum. And uh, it's on uh, two hours every day from 9 to 11 here, Mountain Time. Uh, it's on uh, uh, American Freedom Network, and it's a feed down to one of the Denver stations. We're also heard in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, not Jacksonville, Pen Pen Pensacola, Florida, Monroe, Louisiana, uh, Adrian, Michigan, and people can get it off the, uh, uh, it's AM, well, AM and FM, you can pick it up off the uh, satellite, I mean off of the, yeah, off of the satellite. Uh, I'm, I'm on a promotional campaign now to try to get my show out uh, to other stations because I have some outstanding guests and we need to educate other people as to what's going on in America. So if you have you, if you want to, you know, contact your local AM or FM station, feel free to pick up a flyer back there at my desk and uh, we'll furnish you a promotional package to try to get this show back out around the country. Thanks, Ted. Now, before the informants here in the audience call Ted a crazy conspiracy theorist, uh, I want to remind you that we have the videos of the uh, newscasts right after the um, bombing on April 19, 1995. And I have a few sentences transcribed here, and I'm just going to read them to you in case you don't, some of you can't make it to the workshop where we'll show you the video. I'm quoting, the, um, I'm quoting Channel 4 first. It's now confirmed through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. It was an explosion at 9 o'clock this morning that did that damage there, blowing off the entire front of the north face of that building. A second bomb was found on the east side of that building, and that second bomb hasn't exploded. It has been confirmed that a second bomb has been found. And about another hour later, Channel 9, through their anchors, went on TV and said, they're going to try to get that third bomb out. And then again, Channel 4 interviewed the chief medical director of uh, St. Anthony Hospital, who was explaining and apologizing why he couldn't go into the building and get survivors. He said, it's because we have to wait for those two other explosive devices to be removed. Again, uh, interviews on Channel 9, the, they interviewed Mike Arquette Arnett, who was an attorney, and he explained he was there at the scene, and he talked to the Department of Justice. And he said, I quote, The Justice Department has confirmed a second different explosive device has been found in the Murrah building, and they are defusing it. Both the second and the third bombs were larger than the first. He explained that the reason the Oklahoma City bomb squad had to leave the scene is because they didn't know how to defuse a military bomb. Now this is on the, the newscast that we'd like to show you because we're not crazy conspiracy theorists. Now um, before I go into what happened at the trial and the purpose of my uh, contributing to this presentation is because I have all the documentation of the trial that was not reported in the Rocky Mountain News, the Denver Post and all the other newspapers. But I want to clear something with the informants in the room here. I learned at the Oklahoma City bombing trial the prosecutor said um, that America's safe because they now have one in five people at Patriot meetings um, are informants now. So for all of you, I wanted to point out that um, the reason you've all been selected as informants is because the government has something on you. And the fact that they have sub something on you helps you get the job done. And the same qualifications, meaning you've done something illegal, is the very same thing that precludes you from having protection from the government when you need it. Of course, um, Mr. Gagan and Carol Howe both had uh, immunity agreements with the government. And I'll show you Kerry Gagan's immunity agreement that protects him and saves him from the FBI ever turning on him. This is a letter to James, Carrie James Gagan, and the terms of the contract explain that he will be protected in case the bad guys ever come after him for snitching. You see paragraph four and five, though, totally reverses everything they said in paragraphs one to three. It says, if we decide we don't like the information you give us or it's useless, we withdraw this agreement. 
So you informants, you know, you better read all the paragraphs in your agreements there with the government. This was signed by James Allison, who is in the Denver Department of Justice, and he signed it on September 14th. Well, after Kerry told the FBI that they, he was uh, informed that there was going to be a bombing in the, um, the, the West, it would be either Oklahoma City or it would be Wyoming or it was going to be Denver, they just patted him on the head and said, you know, nice job, but they didn't seem very interested in the bombing. They were just more interested in how he could uh, keep track of running drugs from Mexico up to the Denver airport. So it seemed as though uh, the people in charge of that really only wanted to know who would infiltrate their drug group, move in on their territory. Well, here we have mainstream media, for those of you who need to have mainstream media as your source. Uh, Rocky Mountain News says, Denver man told a bomb plot, McVeigh attorney says. So we have Stephen Jones, with the credibility of being a licensed BART attorney, explaining that he has an informant explaining how there is a drug running group going from the Iranian embassy in Mexico up I-25 to the Denver airport. Well, it was this information that was finally acted upon because Kerry Gagan wouldn't keep his mouth shut. And he said to the FBI, if you don't use my information regarding my information on the bombing, I'm going to start going to the press. I'm just showing you this, that in April, finally, the drug running group that Kerry Gagan was working with while he was gathering information on the bombing, they were finally busted, and you can see there that they used the Denver International Airport as a shipping hub. Uh, it was Colombian drugs in going from Mexico to Colorado. And um, Denver's a distribution center, so to speak, for Los Angeles and Greeley. Greeley's pretty important. Well, when he realized that there was definitely going to be a bombing, he got upset because he realized that they were ignoring him. They weren't paying any attention to the information that was going to save lives. So here, when he said, I'm going to go to the press about this, and he also went to the Oklahoma City Fire Department, and he warned them personally. So you've heard that the Oklahoma City Department was standing by on April 19th. It's because he warned them, and as punishment for warning and, and going uh, beyond the scope of his uh, agreement, you see the last sentence here. It says, the immunity granted in the letter of September 14th is hereby revoked. So for you informants in the, in the audience, I need you to understand that you're on the wrong side because nothing they promise you is going to come through. And they tried to do that with Carol Howe. And fortunately, Carol Howe survived. They're calling her a fruitcake and mentally incompetent. It did preclude her from testifying at the McVeigh trial. But in the meantime, she, she is not going to be killed, as they have, Kerry Gagan has gone into hiding because uh, they're after him, and one attempt has been made on his life. But in Kerry Gagan's case, he filed a lawsuit against the United States government and Mr. Allison and the Department of Justice, and he said that he wanted to sue them for breaking the agreement and putting his life in danger, even though he'd done a good job in everything that they'd required of him. Well, that case was sitting there in, in Denver, 97S308, and it, the decision finally came in. Judge Sparr in Denver, he kicked out the complaint, and he didn't even require the United States to respond to it. And I'd like to read you what Judge Sparr said as a way of kicking Kerry Gagan, ex-FBI informant, out. Judge Sparr said, The theme of the action is the plaintiff's belief that he has a constitutional right to be an informant. Plaintiff alleges that he has a liberty and property interest in the September 14, 1994 immunity agreement. He's mistaken. The Constitution simply doesn't provide any such right. But then Judge Spar went on to hint that perhaps Mr. Gagan should have brought a breach of contract case. So just sending Mr. Gagan back up with the excitement that perhaps there's a remedy for being uh, completely screwed by the FBI, Judge uh, Spar 
pulled the rug out from under that because he goes on in his order and he says, however, you can't bring a breach of contract case because illegal contracts are void. So if you are an informant out there and you think that there's any remedy for the government turning on you, you better think again. Well, what we intend to do at the uh, workshop tonight is show you the evidence that we gathered from the Oklahoma City bombing trial. And I'd like to just tease you with it because I see that we've run out of time. They're waving to me. I wanted to point out that there is plenty of information from the trial information, from the documentation that was not reported in the press, that supports what Ted is saying. It's got, he talked about prills. And he talked about how ANFO bombs have to have um, certain materials. None of this evidence was proven uh, at trial. And when the FBI did try to fabricate some evidence that would support an ANFO bomb, they failed miserably, and it's funny, and you'd, you'd enjoy seeing exactly how they hung themselves with the very evidence that they thought was going to prove their ANFO bomb. So I hope you, that you can come to our workshop, and we'll show you the videos of mainstream media supporting Ted's argument and we'll show you how to find the evidence from the trial that supports Ted's argument. That is that there was more than one bomb and it definitely wasn't an ANFO bomb. I'd like to uh, close and mention that uh, my friend Bill has, uh, gave me uh, information about my radio broadcast. It's heard here in Denver on KHNC 1360 out of Johnstown from 9 to 11. If you folks are in the Denver area. I'd like to also mention that <coughs> Carol Howe um, was supposed to have some sort of a protection, you know, not be identified. Well, the FBI furnished her identity to Stephen Jones, the attorney for McVeigh, and of course, uh, with that, her life was then in danger. So they actually endangered her life by making that information available. That should always be held in the strictest confidence. The likes all, yes? I've heard that 6,300 of the Gulf War veterans are filed. I've heard that also, that the, uh, not only that, but uh, uh, the 6,400 files of the veterans from the desert in that building, that's one of the reasons it was blown up. That plus uh, passed the anti-terrorism legislation. I'd like to also mention that uh, uh, I heard from a source inside the FBI that every militia group in America is, uh, has an informant or a source are more sources in them, and so they do. They know exactly what the militia people are doing. I've been asked to be a national spokesperson on a number of occasions for groups or organizations. I refuse every one of them. I'm strictly a loner. Uh, I won't get involved with any group. Um, you know, I'll be glad to give speeches and lectures. Also, I'd like to mention that if any of you agents out there, government agents out there, are interested in this report, if you come back to my table back, there, I'll give it to you for free, providing you identify yourself and. You furnish me your social security number. Okay. Uh -huh. Question. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Linda and Ted. As the proverb says, time goes fast when you're at global global.